Can't get that thing out of my soul, y'all. These are the things that keep me up at night. Praying for lives to be healed, for hope to be found. These are the things that keep me up at night. And I, you know, I told one of my friends who pastors a church in Florida, I told him I just want to see a move of God. That's all I want in my lifetime. To see God do something exceedingly and abundantly beyond anything that we could ask, think, dream, or believe for. And I'm inviting you into that same level of belief. Uh, before we jump in, uh, I love to do giveaways. I love to give away free things. It's a delight in my heart. Man, I got good and sweaty. It's like a fire. Shut up in my bones. Um, so, I was told by a mentor once, what gets celebrated gets repeated. We'll see if it's true. And so we love when you guys show up early and expectant and ready to receive from the Lord. And so today, I want to give somebody who came before the doors were even open because they knew. Thank you. Thank you. Look, we got lights now. Look at that. We're academic church now, yeah. We, we're moving out of our cool teenage years into adulthood. You know, I, I think the lights, um, I think they shook the first gathering. They, they, they weren't trying to worship. <clears throat> but I'm, uh, I'm glad to see that the 11 o'clock came to do the work. <laughs> Let's say a quick prayer and we'll jump in. Father, thank you. Thank you for all that you are doing and all that you have done. Uh, meet us now through your word we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's what I know to be true. And here's what I know to be a fact. That many of you right now are worried about money. In fact, I, I would go so far to say that for some of us, our anxiety about money is so high that we even thought about missing this service today. So I bless you for powering through. Uh, money is a difficult topic for us. Uh, in fact, um, I, I was talking to Will Berg after the first service, and he said, you know, now I'm going to transliterate this. He said, Pastor, you was preaching better than they were talking. And he said, you know, people get real quiet when we start talking about money. And why is that? Well, the only thing that makes something avoidable is if we fear it or if we idolize it. And so I'm hoping that neither of those things will be true among us. And that we would, through the next five weeks, truly be set free from the prevailing anxiety we have around money. In fact, according to the Mind Over Money survey conducted by Capital One and the Decision Lab, 77%, okay, 77% of Americans say that they are daily anxious about their financial situation. That is three out of every four people. So you look at the road that you're sitting on, Three out of the four people proximate to you are worried right now, anxious right now about their financial situation. 58% of people feel that their financial situation controls the whole of their lives. 52% have trouble controlling any money-related worries. And in fact, what we're most worried about in order are our financial future, uh, which includes not having enough money to retire. Right? I know we're not all there. Some of y'all are still in your 20s and think you're going to live forever. God bless you. I'm going to tell you, you're going to wake up 35 and every injury you ever had as a child is going to reappear at once. Every time you fell down and bounced right back up, it all comes back again. Right? 
Isn't that amazing about children? Like children run head first into a wall, bounce off, get up. I heard myself stepping off a curb yesterday. <laughs> um, 43% of people say that they feel fatigued. Right? Just tired thinking about it. Just tired thinking about it. 42% say that they have trouble concentrating at work. At work. 41% of people say that it messes with their sleep. They can't rest at night because they're worried about managing their debt levels. They're worried about keeping up with the cost of living. They're worried about having enough. And so if it is true, categorically true, that, that at least three-fourths of us are right now anxious and worried about our financial situation, then I think it would also be categorically true that what? All of us want to be free from financial anxiety. Amen? All of us do. Nobody wants to live this way. Nobody wants to wake up every day fearful about if they're going to make it or not, living from paycheck to paycheck, which, by the way, the vast majority of Americans do. The vast majority of Americans are one minor or major catastrophe from total financial ruin. Family, hear me. Oh, almost did it. What's the over under that I stay in this chair? Uh, <laughs> family, hear me. Hear me. Jesus promised us abundant life and excessive anxiety is not abundant life. We want to be free, but we have a hindrance to that freedom, don't we? We have a hindrance that to, to the freedom from financial anxiety, and that hindrance is the cost of living and consumer debt, which are crushing us. I feel it, and you feel it, especially the debt piece. In fact, the total personal debt in the U.S. is in, at an all-time high at $14.96 trillion. Trillion. It's a T in front of that thing. Trillion. And, and when I saw this, the thing that set me back, honestly, was not the credit cards as much as it was the $1.42 trillion in auto loans. $1.42 trillion on a depreciating, and we're going to talk about this later when we get to investing, on a depreciating asset that will inevitably end up in a junkyard. $1.42 trillion. I'm still trying to process that. In fact, the stack of debt kind of lines up in this order, uh, um, starting from any debt at $14.96 trillion, and then it kind of breaks out from there. The average debt per household, this shook me, the average debt per household is $158,000. It also breaks down by age range. I'm going to tell you, there's a particular group of people I'm worried about. We're, we're all struggling, but do you see what I see? What is going on with the millennials? What are y'all doing? Everybody else got a billy. Everybody else got a billy. Y'all messing with a trilly. What y'all doing? All right. I got student loan debt too. We ain't in the trillions. You want to make a bet? Huh? Huh? We talking about 176,000. All right. 18 to 29, who's 18 to 29? Raise your hand. Yeah, man, y'all got all, listen, all the time in the world to deal with this. 30 to 39, where's the millennials? All right, we need a deliverance service for y'all right after this. <laughs> and then it breaks down from there. What shocked me the most was 70 plus. Like you're supposed to be, like you closer to eternity than anybody in the room. And still carrying $336 billion of temporal debt. <laughs> Lastly, the credit card situation. And we're going to talk about credit cards in the coming weeks and why some of us may not need to have them at all. Right? Billions of dollars. 
in pre-loaned money. Now, when I saw all this data, it was pretty alarming to me. And I hope it's alarming to you as well. I really do. I really hope that 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 is as light as we can make it. And I do want to make it light. I don't want it to always be heavy. But then there's the reality, right? That seeing it all laid out is a part of the solution. What we refuse to look at, we can't change. Okay? What we refuse to look at, we can't. Now, you can stress that across the compendium of so many areas of your life. They say love is blind. Okay? Guess what? So is my desire to do what I want to do. So in order for us to solve it, we got to look at it. And with, <laughs> with anxiety and inflation, or, or rather debt and inflation at an all-time high, it's no wonder that we're anxious. It's no wonder that we're anxious, that we're afraid for our future. And, and, and when I was writing this, here's how I felt. Can I tell you how I felt? Can I personalize it for a minute? I, I, I felt that this is wrong and heartbreaking because it wasn't incidental. We're going to get to this when we come in next week. But you remember, you remember this from the Sermon on Simplicity. A group of men got together in a room and decided that they were going to change our society from a needs-based society to a desires-based society and convince us to buy new things before old things were even worn out. And now we're here. It's wrong. And it's heartbreaking. No one should have to live with financial insecurity as their daily life and a fear of their future as their daily life. Nobody should have to live like that. And believe me, Brianna and I understand. I'll tell a quick story. You see, um, years ago, we were very much in the same position. Going to bed every single night, worried about money, fighting about money, talking about money, not really knowing what the next day will bring or, 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 or how even some weeks we would make the rent. And in fact, one time, and, and, and I can admit this, okay, and this is a part of the whole, oh, Lord, I almost made it. <laughs> this is a part of the problem. This is a part of the problem. It's owning how we got ourselves to where we are. So let me own this. I made some poor financial decisions. And some of us need to say that out loud. We made some poor financial decisions. And it put us in a position, it put us in a position where we were about to not be able to pay our rent. And so I had to call uh, in desperation. And I was too ashamed to tell my wife this at the time. As a matter of fact, she is yesterday years old when she found out about this. I called my old high school coach and I said, hey, coach, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a bad situation. And, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to make rent this month to take care of my family. And being as gracious as he is, he said, well, well, how much do you need? How much are you short? And I said, $200. And he sent me that money in order to cover my rent. Never made me feel ashamed. Never made me feel bad for myself. I was so grateful for that. Grateful for you still if you ever catch this, coach. N never made me feel like I had failed as a man even though I felt all of those things internally. And so the question maybe you have right now is what changed? What changed? If that's where you were, what changed? Well, we became, and I want you to write this word down, desperate. We became desperate enough. We became desperate. And that, that is the word I need you to bracket. Have you reached a point of desperation yet? We became desperate enough to abandon managing money the way we've been trained by our host culture. And we began investigating and then operationalizing managing money the way that God shows us in the word. That is what changed. We took everything to him. And for the last eight years, 
eight years, Brianna and I not only dug our way out of consumer debt, but God has been so good to us that we've achieved financial goals we never thought we would see. In fact, that your boy's credit score got an eight at the top of it, and I'm just feeling real good about that. Now, listen, I think it was 458 when we got married. Listen, look, look. If, if, if I don't tell you the truth, you're going to keep lying to yourself. Almost ruined this woman's life. That's why you got to stay away from campus. They pretty, but they got debt. Now, listen, if you didn't get that reference, expand your friend circle. Broad, broad, you're in this church for a reason. Find somebody who will explain that to you. But I want you to hear the number on that. What did I say? Eight years. Almost a decade. Almost a decade of work. Am I talking right now, babe? of work, of hard choices, of red beans and rice, five out of seven days a week. Until we dug ourselves out of the hole. So as we get ready to go through this five-week series, I need you to remember that, that you're not going to get these principles and then next week your whole financial situation is going to change. Okay? For you gym rats out there, how do you grow muscle? Time under tension. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some time and some commitment to actually see this thing out. And here's the lesson we learned through this process. We learned that God frees us from financial anxiety when we manage money his way. That's what we learned. You see, again, part of the problem is we want to manage it our way and then have God put his sauce on it. And then we wonder why we're anxious. You ever find your kid in a precarious situation, one of your children, and all they had to do was ask you for help in the first place? But now they're upside down <laughs> inside their own toy bag, screaming, <laughs> screaming for help. Because they wanted to do it their way and they didn't want to call on you until they knew they couldn't pull themselves out. And we do the same thing to God. So the invitation today is to stop doing it that way so that we can do it the way that God is inviting us to do. The only cure for anxiety, the only cure for anxiety of any kind, including this financial anxiety, is total trust in the God of peace. <laughs> it's not just a pithy statement. That is a weaponized truth. A weaponized truth that will tear down lies and strongholds in your life. And listen, it will destroy the anxiousness you deal with. In fact, this is Paul's message to the church at Philippi. Uh, and, and I want you to write this down if you can keep it up. I'll repeat it a couple of times. You do not have to be anxious about anything if you trust God with everything. I said I'm going to teach today, but let me just stand and preach for just a moment. You do not have to be anxious about anything if you would trust God with every thing. Here's how he captures the idea. Man, I like doing that. Here's how he captures the idea. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. <clears throat> Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And then, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, here's a question I want you to ask yourself as we proceed through this. How does joy have anything to do with curing anxiety? What does joy have to do with curing anxiety? Well, this is what Paul believes. He believes that the path begins with 
joy. And so he tells his first readers what? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it, rejoice. Now, I know we're not all Greek scholars, but the word always means always in all languages. Okay? Rejoice in the Lord when the breakthrough comes through. Rejoice in the Lord when things fall your way. Rejoice in the Lord when your circumstances go the way that you hoped they would. Rejoice in the Lord when God answers your prayer on time the way you asked him to. No, 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 no. Rejoice in the Lord always. In fact, Paul is so emphatic about the necessity of joy in the life of a follower of Yeshua that he repeats it. Again, I say rejoice. Now, how do we rejoice always? By understanding, by understanding first what? That joy is a frame of mind, not a feeling. Joy is a frame of mind, not a feeling. Not a feeling. Joy, and this invitation from Paul, is not some, you know, cheer up or there, there, it'll be all right. No, 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 no. It's an invitation to believe differently. You see... Joy is derived, joy is derived from our proximity to Jesus, not the certainty of our situation. That's where joy comes from. It's about our closeness to Jesus, our proximity to Jesus, not the certainty of our situation. That's why Paul tells us in verse 5, what? Jesus is near. The Lord is at hand. He is here. He is present. He is close. He will never leave you or forsake you. As long as you are proximate to Jesus, joy will linger in your life. Those are facts. And when we know and live as though Jesus is near to us, guess what? We will have no lack of joy. Now, again, how is joy connected to anxiety? Here's how. Jesus Nearness is not only the source of our joy, but it is the nearness of Jesus that liberates us from anxiety about anything, including money. You see, a joyful person won't be an anxious person. It's in the phrase itself. Joy, what's the second half of that? Full. So if I'm full with joy, then there's no room for anxiety. If my cup is if my cup is already overflowing with the joy of the Lord, then there is no room for anxiety. Now, I want to make a qualifying statement. Because Paul's about to say something pretty dramatic. When Paul's referencing anxiety here, he's not talking about clinical anxiety. That's a real thing. And it's a function of the fallen world in which we exist. And so I'll say this as I've said it many times. If you need your medicine, take your medicine. Okay? Take your medicine. Take your medicine. But what he's talking about right now is not an anxiety born of chemical happenstance inside of our body it's an anxiety born of poor decision making in which we have not invited the Lord and now we're worried about the outcome it's an anxiety born of feeling like we lack control (laughs) and so Paul tells us a person whose eyes and hopes are set on Jesus who is both spatially near, right? The Lord is at hand, who is both spatially near and soon returning to restore everything in this broken world. They will not be consumed by anxiety. They will be freed from it. So much so, and this is why I explained this a minute ago, because Paul said, do not be anxious about anything. Don't even be anxious. How can he say that? Just don't. Stop it. I said, stop it right now. 
How does he say that? Well, because he knows that the joy of Jesus will begin to push that anxiety out. And so he says, instead, listen, instead of being anxious, take that big energy and invest it in taking everything to God in prayer. Instead of taking all that anxious energy into yourself and losing your sleep and death scrolling on social media and peeling through a whole can of Pringles, take all of that energy and invest it into taking everything to God. Here's an earnest question. Do you actually take everything to God? And let's just be real. Do you actually take everything to God? Or do you just take to God those things that you don't think you can solve yourself? I mean, let me just be honest. That this is my lifelong struggle. I go to God when I'm out of solutions. And then I get mad when he doesn't meet me at my point of quote unquote need. No, my point of need was before I got on the road. But now that I'm spinning out of control, I'm like, Lord, where are you? He's like, I'm back here at the starting line. Do we actually take everything to God? Now, don't worry, just pray could seem flippant. (laughs) I can acknowledge that, but it's not. Paul is acknowledging the complexity of the moment. And a call to prayer is not a counsel of despair, but one of confidence. It is, it is, here's how I wrote it. It is the passionate integration of human hopes and fears into the redemptive work of God. That's what it means. In fact, I'm going to say this, and I know it's going to be hard to hear, but financial anxiety is actually not the disease. Okay? Okay? It's not the disease. Financial anxiety is a symptom of functional atheism. Financial anxiety is a symptom of functional atheism born of a persistent neglect of prayer and an addictive belief in self-sufficiency. Financial anxiety is a symptom, a delayed symptom of functional atheism born from a persistent neglect of prayer and an addictive belief in our own self-sufficiency. And so our only remedy to the anxiety that we're struggling with is the thing that we so often avoid, which is to talk to God about it and trust him with it. In fact, here, here's a little rubric for you, for prayer. We call it Acts. Adoration, God, you are so good and awesome and powerful and merciful. Confession, please forgive me for always trying to do life on my own terms. Thanksgiving, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. And then supplication, help. (laughs) Don't overcomplicate this thing. One of my favorite prayers in the Bible, remember? Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Help. Take everything to God in prayer. Ask him to take away your anxiety. Ask him to help you feel the nearness of Jesus. Ask him to help you trust. When you do this, Paul says you will not be anxious. Instead, you will have peace, but not just any peace. You will have the peace of God. Now, make no mistake. The peace of God is not an absence of chaos. It is a centeredness in chaos. The peace of God is not always removing you from the storm. It's allowing you to stand up to the storm. He says you will have the peace of God. That will allow you to face the pain of a moment without succumbing to panic. This is the promise. And this peace is not just any peace. This peace is an active peace. Somebody say active peace. It's an active peace. Because what does Paul say? Paul says that the peace of God. Oh, 
the peace of God will do something powerful. It will guard your hearts and minds. That's literally what the word says. You know the image that he's trying to evoke, if, if you want to nerd out with me for a minute. He's trying to evoke the image of a military garrison surrounding precious cargo. So when we take everything to God, we experience the joy of God, which pushes out anxiety. We experience a new trust in God, which drives us to persistent prayer. And in taking everything to him in persistent prayer, then we receive the peace of God. And the peace of God protects us from ourselves and our environment. And surrounds us in a way that regards us as something precious. Now, here's the twist. Okay, here's the twist. Yes, we're supposed to take everything to God in prayer. But we cannot pray away our financial anxiety and do nothing to change our relationship with money. We cannot pray away our financial anxiety and do nothing to change our relationship with money. And I see people usually go one of two ways. They go all financial wisdom. And then they end up in the seat that I was in, all financial wisdom until they forget God in the process and then find themselves in a situation that they can't get themselves out of. Or they go all prayer where God's got to meet me here and God's got to do it and God's got to do it. But you're still trying to live a whole foods life on an Aldi budget. (laughs) I'm just saying. All these produce is organic too. All right. And, and, And so if you think that you're not going to change at all but pray and God's going to enter in, I'm telling you that's not how that's going to work. You have to take the anxiety to God and then also change your relationship with money. And when you're willing to do both, when you're willing to do both, then I promise you, I promise you, this is a fact, it's from the word of God. When you're willing to do both, you make room for God to do miracles in your finances. When you're willing to do both, you make room for God to do miracles. Yes, we need to pray and invite God into the situation, but we also need to abandon the host culture's way of managing money and manage money the way that God has instructed us. And when we do that, God shows up. And not only does he show up, but he shows out. He shows out. So what is God's way? That will free you from financial anxiety. It can be summarized in the words of the late, great John Wesley. I gain all I can without hurting either my soul or my body. Fellow workaholics, first lines for us. I gain all I can without hurting either my soul or my body. I save all I can, not willingly wasting anything, not a sheet of paper, not a cup of water. Yet by giving all I can, I am effectually secure from laying up treasures upon earth. Yea, and I am secured from either desiring or endeavoring it as long as I give all I can. This is the recipe. This is the formula. This is it. Save all you can. Make all you can. Yeah, you didn't know it was going to be that kind of serious, did you? Please secure the bag. Stop brand. That's fine. That is fine. The Lord literally says in Proverbs 3, if you return to God your first and your best, you will be blessed. That's what the Bible says. Save all you can. Make all you can. Give all you can. Enjoy all you can. Again, I don't know what kind of series you thought it was going to be. I want you to enjoy it. But only in light of doing it God's way. In fact, If you apply this four-part biblically inspired formula, you will, you will, listen to me, you will experience miracle after miracle in your finances, I promise you. You will be relieved of financial anxiety. You will be confident and assured about money. But this is important because I know how we are. Well, what if I do one in four? What if I do three and four? What if I do four, 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 four? I know how we are. Right? 
you need to hear me on this. And this is maybe the most important thing I'm going to say to you today. If you neglect any part of it, there are no promised fruitful outcomes. It works together as a whole. It works to get its all or nothing. That's where it is. That's where it is. If you think you're going to skate by piecemeal in this thing, and then get to the end of the series and be like, you told me. I'm like, well, which one did you skip? Well, number three. <laughs> Sorry. A closed fist can't be filled by the Lord. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Right? So it's all four. It's all four together. And that's how we're going to spend the next four weeks is breaking each of these down individually. How do you save all you can? How do you make all you can? Right? How do you make all you can? How do you give all you can? How do you make room to enjoy all of it? This is vital for us to get. You know how important our relationship with money is? 12 out of 38 of Jesus' parables were about money. 12 out of 38. That's a full third. A full third. In fact, the late Billy Graham said, if a person gets their attitude towards money straight, it will help straighten out almost every other area in their life. Yes, Jesus promises us peace in exchange for anxiety, but this is our part of appropriating that peace. This is our part. Now, for those of you who are listening or watching online right now, and maybe you're not a follower of the way of Jesus yet, or, or, or perhaps you're in a season of deconstruction or reconstruction trying to figure out where you're at, here's what I would say. We may not share a common belief, but we share a common humanity. Amen. And in that common humanity, guess what? We both share that common anxiety. We share that common anxiety, right? This incredible anxiety about our financial future. 77%, in fact. And so here's my appeal to you today. Since it has become abundantly clear that our host culture's way of managing money is not working to the tune of $14.96 trillion not working, since it's apparent that it's not working, is it worthy for you today to try and do this God's way? Not only for the sake of your sanity, but also for the sake of your soul. Why? Because Jesus wants good for you. He wants good for you in every area of your life. He wants good for you in every area of your life. He wants to cover you. He wants to protect you. He wants to keep you from fear. He wants to surround you. He wants to keep you from worry and anxiety. He wants that for you. In fact, I heard this story recently about a fire in Yellowstone National Park here in the U.S. And the ranger went out after the fire to check things out to, to see what the damage was. And he got to a tree and there was uh, the charred remains of a bird at the base of the tree with its wings spread slightly open. And he was so unnerved by the scene that he took a stick and he just kind of turned the bird over to, to, to try and help his mind wrap around what he was seeing. And as he lifted the wing of the bird, three little baby chicks ran out from beneath her. And it became apparent to him that the mother bird had been willing to die to protect her chicks and the chicks under her wing had lived. So it is with Jesus, <laughs> likened to our mother hen who covers us and dies for us to secure our souls. Listen, to secure our souls, but not that only. Stop with the vertical axis of the cross and forget about and, and then live forgetting the horizontal one. Not only to secure our souls, but to give us abundant life here and now. And to free us from every anxiety that we could have, including financial anxiety. And so here's the thing, regardless of what we believe, if you want change, real change, and freedom from financial anxiety, and then you need to he heed Paul's words and take every request to God in prayer. Give him your anxiety, but you also must do the work. You got to do the work. Learn and follow the formula for financial freedom and security. You got to do the work. You got to do the work. Now, if the idea of saving and earning and giving and enjoying all you can is still a little too fresh for you, to consider applying tomorrow, which I hope some of us would leave out today and be like, I'm doing this tomorrow. But if that seems a little too high for you, here's what I would say. Come back next week and the week after that. And the week after that. 
and learn it and engage it and let it get into your bones a little bit and then see where you are on the other side of that. And and, and this next week, we're going to talk about saving all you can regardless of your income level. Now, here's the promise. If you do this, you will have a financial education. You will manage money free from anxiety. You will secure your financial future, which is the thing that most of us want. You will give more than you ever have. And listen, the Lord will mess around and use you to change the world. He will do that. But if you continue to manage money that God has entrusted to you, the way that our host culture has taught us to manage money, then you are guaranteed to remain anxious and fearful about your finances. You are guaranteed to remain insecure about your future. You are guaranteed to remain saddled with consumer and credit card debt. You are guaranteed, guaranteed to continue to be unable to give as your heart desires. You know, I envision a world where you and I are no longer anxious about money, but instead confident and assured. And listen, in that confidence, able to become examples to our neighbors, to our friends, to our coworkers, to our family, examples of abundance. And so here's the invitation today. Join me on this journey. Let's figure out how to do this God's way. And let's see the fruit, the fruit that he has for us on the other side. Father, we pray now in the name of Jesus that you would apply this word to our hearts and that we would be resolutely changed because of it. Father God, I pray that you would pull down our defenses now. Lord God, that we would normalize discussing money because you normalized it and that we would be free from doing things the way that the host culture does them so that we can be free to do them the way that you do them. It is now in this moment we ask in Jesus' name, amen.